first of all, thank, I want to thank the organizers uh, for, like Niva, for putting me out of my dark office. It seems much more interesting and much more fun to be here than there. Um, the idea of uh, predictive policing is fascinating from, the, from my perspective. I know nothing about technology and learn technology, but, uh, but as a criminal law professor and someone who studies criminal justice, it's of course a, a, a fascinating issue from the perspective of what we do. If we, if, we can, in, if we can predict how people will behave in one sense or, the, or, or another, what does that mean about the free choice um, uh, idea, of, which is the, base, uh, the basic idea for any criminal responsibility, especially in the last four decades since almost all the world sort of neglected the idea of uh, uh, consequentialist penal systems and moved more to just desert and re retributive thought of criminal justice system. But the time is running. Uh, that's why I'm looking forward, of course, to hear everybody. Time is running, and we will uh, uh, start with uh, the presentation of Dr. Uh, Yafit Lev Aretz uh, from the City University of uh, New York, who will explain why choice and consent are hardly the solutions for di digital surveillance and the uh, big data collections problems and concern. Yafit, please. Thank you. Thank you, Oren. Okay. Can you all hear me? Are we good? I always have problems with the height of the mic because I'm tall. Um, so I want to thank the organizers of this really fantastic conference. And um, allow me to introduce Yasmin Green. She is the head of research and development in Jigsaw. It's a technology incubator uh, and a think tank on, owned by Google. And Jigsaw is dedicated to understanding global challenges and devising technological solutions, which we all know is problematic, but bear with me for now. Um, in an interview with um, MIT Technology Review, Ms. Green um, quoted saying, ISIS pretty much masters many media, from radio to leafletting. When it comes to the internet, they've really understood the power of micro-targeting. And after identifying this global challenge, Ixta moved to finding a technological solution, because that's what they do. And they came up with the redirect method. So the redirect method works like this. Um, out of all Google users, Google identifies those who are likely to be potential ISIS recruits. Then, based on their searches and perceived interest, after identifying those potential recruits, Google steps in and adds to the search result page, at the very top, an additional result that leads the user to a YouTube playlist. In this YouTube playlist, the user can find videos that counter ISIS propaganda. So for example, they will find videos about ISIS corruption. They will find videos about the way they treat women and children and the elderly. And they will even find videos of religious leaders saying ISIS is not the way Islam meant Islam to be. So Google says that the redirect method succeeded in reducing ISIS recruit by 30%. Yes, I'll let the numbers sink for a second. 30%. No government in the world has succeeded in reducing ISIS recruits by these numbers. Now, we can challenge the numbers. We can ask how they came up with it. But again, that's not the purpose of this talk, so we'll leave it aside for now. The idea is that it's a record. And I hope that we all, when we hear about this story, we all feel very comfortable. We're very happy to hear that we can deal with ISIS. We can deal with the um, ISIS recruits. We can diminish the numbers. And we can do that very effectively. Um, but I think and I hope that at the same time, we all feel very uncomfortable. Because 
the potential for abuse that this story reveals is significant. And technology is not working. Yeah. Okay, moving on. So, looks like, yes. One example for such abuse that we should care about came up before the 2016 election. Two psychologists, Robert Epstein and Ronald Robertson, uh, published a paper and coined the term in that paper, Search Engine Manipulation Effect, SEME. They showed that biased search, result, search ranking can shift the voting preferences of undecided voters by 20% or more. So the idea is that if you are not sure about who you're going to vote for, um, all, Google, all that Google has to do is not to remove any search results from the results. All it has to do is just reordering the results in a different order. So they will show you at the first pages um, some favorable content for candidate A and some stories that place candidate, e, ca candidate B sorry, in a bad light. And then you wouldn't even get to page four. And they showed in some of their studies that um, this method can change undecided positions by 20%. In one of their studies in India, they were able to change undecided voters' opinions by 80%, which is insane. So this brought up some concerns uh, pre-election that Google or Facebook will surreptitiously act to change people's political views. And after the 2016 election, we learned that indeed abuse of Facebook did play a role in influencing the election. But this abuse did not originate in Facebook itself, but in other players making use of Facebook. But going back to the potential to basically mess with our brains secretly and effectively, let's shift to theory. So, the term choice architecture was coined by Cass Sunstein and Richard Teller in 2008 in their book, Nudge. And um, the choice architecture is basically the organization of context in which people make decisions, such as the order in which options are presented, the number of options, the attributes, and the framing of the options. Let's look at some examples. Um, Israelis for sure familiar with that, and I'm sure people from around the world as well. Um, where is the bakery located in the supermarket? Always at the far end of the store. Did you notice that? And the reason for that is simple. We're all humans. When we smell fresh pastries, we just walk there. And we just walk there. We're going to walk all the way to the end of the store. And perhaps we're more likely to pick up something on the way there or on the way back. And this is an example for framing. Look at these two questions. They are almost the same in terms of what they're looking for. But just because the framing is different, people reacted very differently to those questions. And also tipping options. We don't like to make decisions. When we're giving too many options and there is a spectrum, we're most of the time going to go with the middle option. And uh, in New York, they implemented this system of three choices for tipping. And they were able to, to show very quickly that most people would go with the middle option, which became basically the default. So everything I talked about until now is choice architecture. And honestly, it's not new. right? If you think about it, any kind of human interaction is choice architecture. right? It's, from, it's, it's not new. Uh, Thaler and Sanson was very, were very smart to put it in a uh, beautiful, comprehensive theoretical framework. But at the end of the day, um, those are good terms, good theoretical framework, but we're talking about human interaction. And we're talking about looking at human weaknesses and targeting them generally. Okay. But what is different about the Google story that I told you about with ISIS? is that we're moving from general choice architecture to personalized choice architecture. So it's no longer about what makes humans human. It's not about what makes humans human. It's about what makes you yourself. It's about your weaknesses. It's about your views. And it's about who you are. And 
It's the, the result of collection of personal information together with mining aggregation profiling, and then we're able to have optimally targeted individualized choice architecture. And the best example, this is the poster child people of choice architecture, of personalized choice architecture. Cambridge Analytica, for those of you who are not familiar with the story, um, I think it happened in March. This is Chris Wiley. He worked for Cambridge Analytica. And he um, blew the whistle and told the world that Cambridge Analytica, which is a political consulting um, company, was using psychographic information con um, obtained from Facebook profiles to create different psychological profiles and then targeting political ads to those people based on their specific psychological profile. So let's say you're an introvert. Let's say you are an anxious person. We're going to use fear-mongering ads when we um, target ads to you in the political context. So one of the questions that came up after Cambridge Analytica was whether personalized choice architecture is even effective. And I think it's a valid question. The scientific and practical validity of personalized choice architecture is not yet proven uh, to the extent that it's claimed. But I want to argue that there are four reasons why personalized choice architecture will improve. The first reason, we humans are rationally irrational, to paraphrase on Dan Ariely's. Um, book. We don't like to make decisions. We don't like to think too much. We don't like to choose. As simple as that. And at the same time that we don't like to choose and we don't like to think too much, we have an automation race towards a frictionless world. So if we need to get from point A to point B and we have five stops in the way at which we need to make decisions, and automation can make it into two stops, or one stop, or no stops. That's the whole purpose. The idea is for us not to think too much. So if I walk into my office in the morning, in the past, I had to um, greet the guard at the, at the lobby and say, hi, I'm your feet, I work here. And then later, they gave me an ID card, and I just swiped it, and I walked in. And today, we have facial recognition technology, so I don't need to speak to anyone. I just walk in, right? So the whole idea of automation is to eliminate those you know, steps in the middle. And we like to eliminate those steps because we don't like to make them. We don't like to think about, it, about them. We don't like to make those choices. Now, algorithms get to know us very well because we need those algorithms to know us very well in different contexts, and specifically in the context of automation. If we want facial recognition technology to recognize me, this technology needs to know me. If we want Amazon to know what I'm about to buy, by the way, Amazon registered a patent about anticipatory shipping, meaning that they ship something to a center next to where you live, even before you order it. They don't need to wait for you to order. They already know what you're going to order. They have a patent on it. And it's not even new. I think it was like 2016 or something. right? So those algorithms, they know us so well. They know us better than we know ourselves. And guess what? And that's the punchline. Democratic values, free choice, personal autonomy, those are the values that justify our right not to choose. So we have free choice, and as part of our free choice, we don't want to choose. We, don't, we want algorithms to choose for us. And this is why personalized choice architecture, even if we're not there yet, we're going to get there. I promise you. Take more word. So there are many challenges for personalized choice architecture, right? So violation of personal autonomy, there are a lot of line drawing questions. Where does legitimate platform strategizing end and harmful manipulation begin? 
black box concerns. We've heard a lot about that today, scaling bias, discrimination, lack of interpretability. Legal recourses are not really helpful because the GDPR does not address choice architecture. And consumer protection laws may be of help only in cases of deceptive advertisement, but the threshold for that is very high. Election laws are now starting to step in after the Cambridge Analytica story. But at the end of the day, all these laws have to face those really fundamental democratic values that treat our choice as the most important value. And our choice is not to choose, is to let algorithms choosing for us. I'll connect it to national security because that's um, this panel. And I think it's really interesting to take it out of the commercial context into the governmental power context. So when we talk about personalized choice architecture in the context of national security, we need to remember, one, it can be used as an offense and as a, as a defense mechanism. Sometimes we will be, our choice will be um, personalized, personal, personally architecturized, sorry. And uh, sometimes it will be us who use that as a weapon, as a tool, to architect the choice of others. And I think these different uses bring up completely different set of questions. In terms of democratic safeguards, it's important to, um, and it, this follows up directly on Michal's talk, um, it's, it's important to understand that a lot of the important data is not held in public hands, it's held in private hands. And this is why oftentimes if the government is interested in architecting choice on the personal level, in micro-targeting, the government has to collaborate with private entities. And this is where we get to an infrastructure of influence by definition. Um, and this is why democratic safeguards are of, of great importance. And last point on a network effect, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, FISA, in the US, uh, that's the law that allows surveillance um, in national security context. And that law differentiates between citizens and non-citizens and sets different rules for each. And because we're talking about information that is collected from platforms that have very strong network effect, so if you collect information about me on Facebook, it's not just about me, it will be about me and about my friends. That was the whole story of the Cambridge Analytica and how authorization by 250 people turned into collecting information about 87 million people. That's the network effect, right? So it's really, really hard to differentiate, even if we want to legitimately um, architect the choice of a non-citizen, it will be very hard to differentiate between citizens and non-citizens in this context. I'll stop here and architect your choice towards the next talk. Who manipulated me to order the, the set of the orders of the speakers or to say what I'm about to say now? Um, it's, uh, I'll simply go to the next <laughs> speaker while I'm thinking about what to make of, of, of uh, your conclusions. So Dr. Nimrod Kozlowski is a partner in the leading law firm of Herzog Fuchs Neyman, also a partner in the leading venture capital uh, partnership, uh, JVCP. And Nimrod will speak about predicting crime and profiling human, uh, Nimrod, please. Cool. <laughs> Fascinating conference, and we heard so many people talking about elements of my topic, so I'll go to stories. Look at my face. No, really, look at my face. Do I look like a pedophile to you? Think seriously, do I look like a pedophile to you? No. Why not? Why don't I look like a pedophile to you? Who thinks I'm a pedophile? <laughs> Be serious, who thinks I'm a pedophile? Why? Would you think I'm a pedophile if I look like that? An Israeli company called Faceception introduced a new concept to predicting pedophiles. They actually went and uh, went to the government, to the US government, and said, we are able to detect pedophiles. We have an AI tool that will be able to tell with 85% of accuracy whether a person is a pedophile. By the way, not the only, this company, there's a company from Shanghai that says that in 
89% they would tell whether a person is an offensive criminal, violent criminal. What is it based on? They took a database, uh, in the case of perception, they took a database of a few hundred thousand people and marked people who were convicted pedophile in the past. They saw their pictures. And they asked the algorithm to find what are the similarities between people who were pedophiles and what are the kind of like the parameters that would not be significant in people who are not pedophiles. And they found some uh, statistical uh, significance to kind of like the distance between the eyes, uh, the kind of like the way that the muscles here, the skull. The way that the skull, they got to uh, something about the distortion of the skull. You know what it reminded me? In 1935, the Nazis invented a new machine that was basically a helmet. And this helmet measured the skull of a person. And by someone who is well known, Professor Lombozo, who is well known in uh, psychology, he came to the conclusion that people who have tendency towards criminal behavior would have a different skull. He even had a mathematic formula how the skull would look of people with criminal uh, tendencies. And the Nazis were checking, examining. They actually developed a few hundreds of these machines. People thought it's a bullshit science and leftist science until Faceception, an Israeli company, came with this idea and says, actually, we can in the airport put a camera that would look at people and tell you whether they are pedophiles or aggressive criminals. We thought it's a bizarre idea. But the US government thought it's a good idea and actually started a pilot with them. So in the airports now in the US, they have a pilot with them. And by the way, they even thought that this pilot makes a perfect uh, normative sense. Because you are not discriminating people because they're racial, because they're race, because they're religion, because they're gender. But based on parameters that artificial mis uh, algorithm, artificial intelligence algorithm, found to be statistically significant. And they said it's only a decision supporting tool. We're not actually making a decision to arrest someone based on this. But why shouldn't we use it if there's actually some statistical significance? And it's being used. Second story that I'll tell you, think about it. You're sitting uh, in a family dinner, and you get a knock on the door. And a policeman is coming to you while you're sitting with your wife and telling you, I just want to inform you that according to a new technology we're using, you are one of the 100 families that are most likely to have domestic violence. <laughs> we just wanted to inform you. Thank you for the have a good supper. <laughs> and he leaves the home. He doesn't do anything. He doesn't interrogate any of the members of the family. He doesn't even put any surveillance technologies there. He just informed them that they were statistically found to be more likely to have uh, domestic violence in the home based on their profiles. By the way, true story again. Happened in the US, and the court actually approved this uh, system, saying that it's just predicting crime and helping the police to better communicate with the community about kind of like how they were going to sort or handle domestic violence. But they were not imposing any sanctions on them, or they are not using any, um, any power over them. These two stories, both stories of predicting crime. And in the very short time I have, I'm going to tell you at least my theory about predicting crime. Uh, and actually that we shifted from trying to predict crime to profiling people. That's the old story. So let's go back to the movie that started it all and inspired everybody. Minority Report, you saw it all, you all remember in Minority Report by Steven Spielberg, the FBI agent Tom Cruise have some kind of a crystal ball that indicates about the future. He knows what crime is about to happen. And he gets this crystal ball and he looks on the screen and he sees the murder that is about to happen. In a Hollywood movie, he's running to the scene. He is getting there as the offender is about to stab the victim. He throws his hand and he says, you are arrested for the murder. And the person says, but I never murdered her. 
said the mere fact that you did not commit the crime is irrelevant for the law. You were about to commit the crime. This notion of predicting crime inspired people. And actually, after September 11, the US government decided that's the path to pursue. Because scientists started saying the technology mature now to be able to predict crime. Without going too much into the technical details, there were basically two fields of research. One is called anomaly detection, understanding that something is anomalous in the behavior. So at least there's some statistical significance that the wrongful action is about to happen. The second is called pattern recognition. We know what's the pattern that the crime occurs, and we detect that the pattern is now appearing. The US government that was looking for ways to actually predict crime or stop crime, because there was a crisis. The theory that we used to stop crime before, the deterrence theory of the criminal law, setting the sanction for someone who would do wrong, just didn't work. People were not deterred anymore. The cost of policing in suburban areas was too expensive. And actually, there was, we realized that there's a problem with the old reactive policing model. So everybody was looking whether technology can bring us to a new model that will be able to predict crime and prevent it. The biggest manifestation of this uh, plan was a project called FAST, Future Attribute Screening Technology. Hundreds of millions of dollars invested in this project by DARPA that we got to know about it because someone said, hey, what about the FAST project? And someone inquired, what is the FAST project? So they had to release actually information about the project. The project about fa future attribute screening technology, something about non-intrusive system to predict crime. How it works, imagine that you are in a public space like the terminal or in a, in a federal building, and there are many sensors directed at you, but non-intrusive. You don't have to uh, submit yourself to any test. You don't just assume that there are cameras, recorders, sensors from all, all kinds. And sensors developed so significantly that they can, from afar, actually get everything about me. They can sense the pupils, the movement of the pupils, how the muscles move here, how, what's, uh, how wet are my lips, how salty is my uh, <laughs> here by sweating. They can actually even, uh, uh, from afar, sense how stiff is my muscle. They can sense all of that. And they can sense from remotely even how deep is my uh, breath and the amplitude of my voice. And they also take pictures of the scene, like uh, videos, pictures of the scene. And the assumption is, just as human detect risk by looking at an action that someone is running after a person or that someone looks very stiff or looks very aggressive, that we point our attention. That's the way that guards operate, like in the policemen or guards in the airport. So they said, hey, technology is now capable of doing that. So all these sensors collect the data into an integrated system where the video, the sound, all these sensors will operate together. And the assumption is that we'll be able to come up with some significant result whether there's an anomaly that's happening here that should alter our attention. The anomaly can be analyzed from the video, that there's a scene that looks to be aggressive or it looks to be suspicious. It can be from my body measurements that seem to divert from the normal pattern for a person at my age, my size. Or they can come even from other sensors that sense the environment and are out of the normal pattern. That system that was deployed for tests in uh, airports and in federal buildings was assumed to be able to do what we saw in Minority Report, to alert of a potential criminal behavior. You know, one problem with the system was that they realized that there are too many false positives if we just go randomly about people. So they realize that the way to go is actually to know more about the person. So the way they design it is once you have alert that something is anomalous, now you actually have the permission to inquire into databases like governmental databases or police databases and to check for information about this person. 
to qualify the alert. But basically, that led scientists to understand something else. While we were preoccupied with the concept of predicting crime by looking at behavior and trying to see whether the behavior is anomalous or uh, match some pattern that we know, actually, there's a better chance for us to get results if we go by looking at the person rather than looking at the behavior. Because we realize that we're not collecting enough data in real time. We do not have enough, uh, at least now, we do not have enough significant standardized data that will enable us to get to significant results about crime that is about to happen, certainly not in public places. But if we go after individuals, we are more likely to have a better result. So research shifted elsewhere. It shifted to do something we called profiling. But here the excuse was, hey, we're not profiling people again about racial profiling or gender or something that relates to religion. Not at all. What we do, we go to data and see whether profiles can have some significance about someone that is more likely to be a criminal. Remember my story about how the police knocks your door? That's the way that actually they took this research. But then, they actually progressed in this research. Have you seen uh, Black Mirror? There's an episode in Black Mirror called Nosedive. It seemed to be just a story about our Facebook reality and the likes of everything. Everybody, by the way, put likes on my Facebook after this talk. So it's the like society. But the idea was that as she goes there and collects likes, and get a score, kind of like how I'm, how I'm scored as a person, how likable I am, there's also the downside. What if I misbehave or I insult someone? I can see actually my scoring goes down. And the show wanted to show us what's the implications. It wanted to show us that while where you have these likes and you are very positive in your score, you'll be invited to all the parties, you can come to kind of like uh, uh, guarded community, gated communities, but if scores goes very low, probably the door would not open anymore at your employment office. Probably you will not be able to get an interview. And they show it there to show that probably this score would affect options that are available to you in life. We thought, wow, it's a good TV show. But Charlie Brooks, actually the director of uh, Minority Report, keeps reminding us that Minority Report is about our reality. Actually, the reality 10 minutes from now, if we just don't pay attention. So is it a TV show? Not at all. In 2020, every Chinese person would have their social score. It started with a project because in China, there is the biggest migration ever from people from uh, the village to the city. 400 million people are about to migrate to the city. But how can you actually evaluate them? How can you tell if they are a risk? How can you tell to predict about their wrongdoing? How can you give them a loan? How can you give them the first job? Would you date them? The problem with these people, they came with no records. Why they came with no records? Because they came with places when they had no bank account and no kind of like digital records that associated them. So the Chinese were looking for a system that will able to give credit scoring at the beginning, but not only that. They realized that we need more than credit. We need something like social scoring. Who is trustworthy? So they started a project, a governmental project called Sesame. And in the Sesame project, they told the big companies like Tencent, Chi, uh, Huawei, Chiwi, they said, hey, you actually have a lot of information about people because it's a mobile first economy. People do commerce in the mobile. They interact, they date, they play in the mobile. There's so much data that you collect. We as the government, we're not going to enact any law for that, but we're just going to let you to test, to try. Just try. Whether you can come up with some significant social trustworthiness index. And when you give uh, private companies the ability to play with data, they love it. So they played with the data, and they came with a sesame score. It looks cute, no? Sesame score. Every person in China has a score from 300 to 900. And they even tell you about the score. They say it's open. You should know your score. 
you should actually adjust your behavior according to your score. So they tell you, do you buy diapers online? You're a great family man. Do you play games online? 10 hours straight? Not so good. You actually post a critical post about the government? You can see your score taking a nosedive. And not only that, the Chinese government actually said to the companies, publish how you get to the scores. We want people to adjust their behavior, to change. We actually want to educate them, not to punish them. And they even said, you know, you should associate with people that are good influence on you. So they said, your score would be affected by the score of your friends and family. So in China, if you look at your Sesame score, it's not only your score at the center, you see the score of the people that are connected to you. And they, you see how the change in their score affect your score. Because the Chinese said, socialize with people which are good influence. And you know, the Chinese government, which started this project as a private project, posted a report. It was translated to English. You can read it. It's 80 pages report saying the experiment was so successful that we decided that it will be a national project. By the year 2025, every Chinese person would have the, what they called the social trustworthiness index. Every person would have a score. And they already said that according to your score, you can get benefits. You can get a loan to start your first business. You can get a, a governmental position to start with if you are scored above 700. However, they said, and it's too bad, that if you'll be scored under uh, 400, unfortunately, you would not be able to buy a train ticket or get a travel permit outside of your residence because you know, people should not a uh, this score associated with you. They actually tried it on a community of 8 million people, and soon enough it started to show in significant classes or tiers of the economy. But now, let me just uh, wrap up with this thought. As we are shifting from predicting crime to profiling people and trying to see whether there's something inherently bad or something that we can understand the trustworthiness that is inherent in a person, that kind of like something that would help us to predict his behavior, I would just ask you, when I tell this story, everybody said, yeah, but it's China. <laughs> and Chinese, you know, human rights is not the best uh, trait. So it's China. But actually, the joke is on us. Because in China, they actually did it transparent and public. And you can tell what affects your scoring. And something like the FICO scoring, the credit scoring in the US, you can do something to change it. There's a lot of discussion whether you can actually change your score and what's the effect when you get low score and whether, whether you'll be able to uh, change it later in the future. But at least in theory, you can. But what we see that in Western society, we get scoring, I'll, I'll finish with that, we get scoring all the time. When you want to be an Uber driver, they ask permission to your Facebook to score you according to somewhat similar social trustworthiness index. When you apply for a job now, on the background, the company would analyze the available social data about you and sometimes also would ask access to the social networks to score you. And it's not only that, we start seeing companies, just as with the FICO scoring, that saying, we can actually be the scoring company that other companies, we know that you don't have enough data or a good enough model, so just question us. We have an open API. Tell us Nimrod Kozlovsky will tell you his score. Maybe the score is not exactly relevant for your task or not exactly relevant for what you're asking, but isn't it better than what you have now? And the only problem that according to our law at the moment, with some exception with the GDPR, we have no real control over this scoring market. We don't really know who scores us based on which data, how they collect the data. There is no mechanism to appeal it. No one actually is telling you that in the decision not to engage with you, the question comes scoring mechanism. And many decisions about our life, including decisions that gradually are by the government, 
are done by this scoring. So are we predicting crime? Not really. Are we scoring humans? Yes. Have we done something significantly in the law to regulate it? Not yet. Thank you very much. Wow, Nimor, that, that was really fascinating. I have, I have like 30 questions, but <laughs> I'll leave them uh, to the end of the session, assuming we'll have some time. Uh, because we must move to our third speaker, which is our very own Dr. Eldar Haber from Haifa Law School uh, and the Center for Cyber Law and Policy. Uh, before returning to Haifa, uh, Eldar was an associate in the uh, Berkman Klein Center in Harvard, uh, published many papers in the leading technology journals, including Harvard, Stanford, Yale, and most importantly, he's a graduate of our law school. Eldar, please. <laughs> Okay, so um, this is my story. I'm going to talk to you about the fact that we all like data. People like to eavesdrop, you too, I as well. And who really likes data is law enforcement agencies. So as we saw technology and communication started to evolve over time, we saw a lot of different mechanisms by which law enforcement agencies started to seek data. So with the telegraph communication, they sought to access it. That happened with mails, and that happened with the telephone. So the telephone is probably uh, the main key issue which I'm going to talk about because this is what started to uh, be known as wiretapping because it has a wire among, the wi among many things. But um, just a second. So uh, the thing is, and this is highly American, but it applies to a lot of different countries, including the state of Israel and uh, the EU, obviously. The thing is with telephones that it was generally unregulated. Law enforcement agencies were able to wiretap phones since uh, 1890s. And uh, aside from state legislation in the US, it was perceived as a legal thing to do. So what happened was a lot of people started to question whether or not they have privacy protection under the Fourth Amendment. Meaning that if we look at the Fourth Amendment, it protects people to be secure in their person, houses, papers, and effects, again, unreasonable searches and seizures. Now, the question was whether or not a wiretap constitutes a search to this extent. So it went to the Supreme Court in 2098. This is Roy Olmsted. He was a bootlegger uh, during the time of American Prohibition. And the Supreme Court has decided that no, there, this is, does not uh, constitute a search for the Fourth Amendment. Thus, wiretapping was generally allowed. Congress started to regulate these wiretapping of phones in 1934. It enacted uh, a communication act by which wiretapping was actually the practice, practice itself was legal. However, it was inadmissible in court proceedings and there were a lot of different issues revol uh, revolving that. Still, it was a legal practice that uh, um, the law enforcement agencies could engage in. So this has changed in 1967, one of the fundamental most, most, uh, most influential cases in the US uh, was about uh, cuts. The uh, Katz was, as you can see, he was placing bets in a public telephone booth, which was bugged. It had a microphone, and the FBI used it. And, and the Supreme Court said, wait, there is some, something which we start to think about in the context of wiretapping, which is what is reasonable expectation of privacy. This is where the reasonable expectation of privacy test has emerged. Wiretapping was seen at, by the Supreme Court in this case and in another case in the same year as illegal. So Congress rushed and decided that we need to have a wiretap statute. This is 1968. So the wiretap statute or the wiretap act as we also call it basically tells us when can governmental agencies, law enforcement agencies wiretap under which circumstances. We'll get back to that when we'll talk about 
uh, the subject of IoT. So I'm not going to talk about national security, but this is just one another prong of the analysis. FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act in 1978, also re started to regulate which kind of wiretapping can law enforcement agencies uh, uh, conduct in order to, uh, to fight terrorism and a lot of different things which have to do with foreign intelligence. This was later amended after 9-11, but I said that I, in this talk, I will have to skip that. So computers have advanced. We had a lot of technological advancements. Storage capacity started to gain some attraction. And Congress started to realize that wiretapping is only one part of the prong. Another part is that we have stored communication. So under the ECPA in 1986, the Electronic Communication Privacy Act, now uh, Congress regulated stored communication and something which is called pen register, which are devices who can reveal which numbers were dialed. So this was highly important, but bear in mind for the topic of today that this was 1986, and the perception of computers were a little bit different. Then the internet came. And when the internet came, uh, Congress sought to start regulating what will happen when we will try to access communication online, especially for wiretapping. And this is CALEA, the Communication Assistance uh, uh, for Law Enforcement Act, by which, from 1994, some telecommunication providers must enable law enforcement agencies when they receive that wiretap uh, uh, they, they, they required from the court, they are able, they are need to comply with that warrant. Unfortunately, it doesn't apply to most of the internet service providers that you might think of. And there was a further attempt uh, by the FCC to expand this to include what is called VoIP, voice over IP, and that has succeeded. So if you are talking on Skype, then uh, Skype has to adhere to Kalea and its amendments, and they have to actually enable wiretapping if it occurs. And this was just history. This was a short, brief history. But the thing that I want to talk about today is the Internet of Things. So the Internet of Things, just generally, broadly speaking, is anything that is connected to the Internet. There are a lot of different definitions. It doesn't really matter. The thing is that it's things that are connected to the web. Sometimes they are connected to each other. Sometimes they talk to each other, per se. Uh, and you can think about the smart, and I will use the term smart from now on mostly. Smart TVs, smart cars, smartphones, smart coffee makers, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this world is growing apace. It's a huge world. It's a huge world of devices, from toys to everyday household objects to wearables, like the Fitbits, uh, any fitness uh, tracker that actually gathers a lot of info. And this is part, part of the deal here. So this, you know what this is? Alexa. So this is one of the Amazon Echo. This was just like, this is the second or third generation by now. We all call them Alexa because uh, there are Alexa-enabled devices, and that's fine. We could call them Alexa in general. These are known as always ready devices, meaning that they always await a trigger phrase to be, uh, to start working. So many of us might think that Alexa is always hearing us, everything that we're saying. So this is partially true. Uh, as at least uh, as Amazon and Google and all the other manufacturers, the big ones, say that uh, the internal mechanism doesn't really record more than a, a second or s uh, until six seconds, and basically this the information is deleted and nothing is transferred to the cloud unless you utter the Alexa word. The, the, it could be Alexa, it could be Google Home. So this is always ready, but potentially it could be always on because it has to constantly listen. Some other devices like the Nest Cam here, uh, just think of security cameras in your houses, they are always on. Once you turn them on, that's it. They collect information, it goes to the cloud, and many people can uh, go and access it if they have the permission of the company. So we have a lot of these devices. This is just part of the Echo family, the Alexa family. And I want to show you that because if you look at the different devices, you start noticing that it's, it doesn't really matter if we call it the Internet of Things and how it works. It's basically sensors. It's a lot of sensors. It could be microphones, cameras. It could uh, measure temperature. It could do a lot of different things. And it would depend on a lot of the different attributions that we'll talk about. So data 
stored communication, now not wiretapping, stored communications has already started to play a role, a substantial role in criminal proceedings. So we've seen a lot of, uh, this is a case about a Fitbit and uh, rape allegations. So it could acquit someone, it could also uh, uh, help solve a murder crime. And one of the most famous uh, incidents was a year and a, uh, about a year and a half ago by which, uh, it's a case in Arkansas by which the defendant, James Bates, the suspect, uh, he was acquitted later, uh, uh, was suspected to murder one of his friends because of uh, the data that was obtained through the smart meters in his house, because allegedly he washed off the patio between 1 a.m. and 3 a.m. to wash off the blood to conceal evidence. And then they sought, one of the neighbors heard Alexa playing that night and said, well, maybe she overheard something. We want to get that, those recordings. Uh, Amazon refused, by the way. James Bates, the defendant, said, OK, give it. And uh, he eventually was acquitted. So when we talk about stored communi communication, and I'll be brief, I'm starting to sense when, when I read the law, the statute, there are a lot of problems. Because if you want to fall off under the, the Stored Communication Act and get those higher privacy protection than just the regular Fourth Amendment protection, then you have to be classified as what is called an ECS or an, I or an RCS. So uh, basically, and I'll be brief here because I'm running out of time a little bit and I haven't gotten to the normative part, um, there are many problems here. Why? Because all of these things are talking about different types of technology which existed in 1986, just like the transfer of communication or the storage of communication, by which if you think about Alexa, it's a multifunctional device. It could be a search engine sometimes, it could be an email provider for sometimes, you can send emails. Uh, you can talk with other Alexas, so it can be like an intercom, and it could be like a phone, because you can talk with another Alexa and another, if another friend of yours has an Alexa. You can actually use it as a phone, so this multifunctionality actually changes those different specifications which are very, very much outdated. And the problem is that if you don't fall under the SCA and you don't get that protection, there's a very, I would say, odd doctrine in the US, uh, which is called the third party doctrine, by which, and this is a, from a series of Supreme Court cases in the 1970s, saying that there's no reasonable, reasonable expectation of privacy for information converted to, converted to third parties. And there are some exception to this. So if you convey your information for one of the, let's say, the Googles of the world, basically you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy unless the Supreme Court has specifically decided on various cases, one of them just this year, uh, depending very specific types of data. So basically that would mean that all that gather information could go to law enforcement. So if we pass that for a second and we go to wiretaps, so to get a wiretap under the Wiretap Act, you don't just need a search warrant, you need a super warrant. So what is a super warrant? Uh, it's just a warrant with higher requirements. And the problem, when I look at the difference between IoT and the regular search warrants that we used to have, is one of the requirements is that you have to specify the nature and location of the use. Now think about IoT devices. So some of them refrigerators, that will be easy. They're in your uh, kitchen. But if it's a Fitbit, it goes with you. If it's your Amazon Echo, I don't know, you can place it in your living room, it could be in your bedroom. Think about the sensitivity of information in that context. Now, the Wiretap Act actually acknowledges that you can use two different types of things. One of them is a roving bug, another thing is a roving wiretap. So think of the movies that you saw that someone actually doesn't use the phone, it actually places a bug, what, uh, just a small microphone somewhere in the room, maybe on a person that go, goes with them. So here it wouldn't be oral communication, There's a, we can have a theoretical discussion whether talking to Alexa is actually a face-to-face -face talk because this is what oral communication means. But this is actually electronic communication, so it is feasible. You can get a wiretap, roving wiretap for IoT. So the question is, is it desirable or not? And let's say that we overpass this uh, problems of Kalea. Let's say that Kalea applies. There are a lot of different problems uh, that we will have if we will force those companies, just think of forcing Amazon to actually enable wiretap in your house whenever they're requested by a court, lawful interception, 
but it will cost a lot of money. Amazon will deal with it. The smaller companies wouldn't. And that's not the problem. We have so many of these devices. There's almost an infinite number of IoT devices. It's keep growing. It's manufactured all over the world. All of them will have to comply with the different requirements. And that will lead to a lot of chilling effects uh, in sense of innovation. So what could happen, and this is just to toss it out, we can have a private-public partnership, not in a sense uh, of, uh, of uh, conveying data to each other. We can have that by enabling. So some companies will want to voluntarily work with the government and implement those uh, measures. But the problem is security. So we know the Apple FBI case as an example of something which creating backdoors could be very, very harmful to all of us. If we downgrade the security of the system, then we're in a problem. And this is what will happen. We'll have to have uh, to create vulnerabilities in systems to be wiretapped for lawful interception. It's not that we suspect the government will ever abuse its powers, but it happens. So we have to rethink lawful access in the always on era. And this is part of my arguments. Uh, so I'm thinking and just throwing it out. Uh, we have super warrants. Maybe we should have ultra warrants. I'm not sure that ultra is higher than super, but let's go with that. So if we have ultra warrants, we'll have to start rethinking all the different restrictions that are really there, like the relevancy of the information. Think of what happens when you wiretap a phone. Uh, you actually, most of the time, you'll get the person who speaks on the phone. Uh, but part of the time with Alexa, you'll get everyone in the living room. You'll get everyone who talks in that vicinity. It's not just you. We have to have use restriction on the data and the storage, the security, which I've always mentioned. And we have to see whether it actually works. And this is always free. We, ne we need to have a lot of oversight and transparency. And I would love to elaborate on that more uh, later. So I'll uh, still 30 seconds. So uh, one of the biggest changes, and there are a lot, this is just to throw it out is storage capacity. When all this legislation was passed, no one could store uh, th these types of data indefinitely. So what will happen is that we will see a shift between what Amazon could store all the time, not just Amazon, Google of the world, always on devices. Basically, that would mean that who needs a wiretap when all, st all the communication will be stored and it is not not bound to those higher protection of a super warrant. So we might see a transition of just abandoning wiretapping and go to stored communication, by which that means that we have to rethink how uh, those access to work to, to uh, stored communication should work. So just to zoom out, the problem is that there's a higher, broader picture here. We live in a world which is becoming smarter and smarter. We'll have, we have smart devices in our houses. Some of them have microphones. Some of them have cameras. We will, li we will drive in autonomous cars. We all, we already, uh, some of us already drive in smart cars, in cars that are half autonomous or even have an internet connection that will have microphones, that will have cameras. They will have to because this is how they're going to work. And we're going to live in a smart city. So sensors are going to be all around us, and there's going to be a huge blur between what is public, what is private. We'll have to rethink in IoT what the search really means, what is reasonable expectation of privacy. And I have to say, this is not just privacy. It's the reasonable expectation of living here. It's the reasonable expectation of democracy. This is much higher than just privacy because it affects much more uh, values and liberties. We have to rethink stored communication, and we have to rethink wiretapping. Thanks. Thank you so much, Eldar. Um, one of the things I learned is that uh, when I go to criminal law uh, conferences, everybody uses PowerPoint, and here everybody uses this. Well, <laughs> forgot the name. Anyway. Um, the high high tech uh, type of presentations. <laughs> uh, last uh, but not least, uh, Ronnie Knip uh, from the research uh, research fellow of, in the uh, Internet Policy Field Group at the WZB um, uh, Social Science Center in Berlin and PhD candidate in the Freie Universität of Berlin. Please. Please do it to PowerPoint. Yes, it's called point. Oh, good. <laughs> I feel better. So, uh, good afternoon, and um, I'm very honored and happy to speak here today. So, many thanks to the organizers of this conference. 
exactly 9,618 kilometers from here, south of Washington, D.C., another event takes place today with the rather trivial title, Augmenting Intelligence Using Machines. This could really be any AI event, but it's not. It is the intelligence community of the United States meeting the AI industry to ask for help. Attending the event requires security clearance, but the conference fo follows an AI policy paper that was published recently by the US Director of National Intelligence. The competition over AI funding and talent is so tough that even the most secretive enterprise comes out with a public strategy. Intelligence communities are alarmed and keen to expand the use of AI. Or as the DNI puts it, the opportunity is great, the threat is real, the abroad must be bold. In my talk today, um, I would like to give you an overview about the use of AI in sickness intelligence, what is at stake when AI meets sickened, and what challenges arise for AI policies. Surprisingly, intelligence has been missing in many recent debates on AI. If AI-enhanced surveillance is addressed, it's usually in the context of law enforcement and predictive policing, or the military and AI warfare. I propose to address sickness intelligence, or short SIGINT, as a field in its own right. We can think of SIGINT as a specific discipline of espionage with its own professional culture in contrast to human intelligence. I broadly define SIGINT as the surveillance of all traces left by military, political, and civil actors in the electromagnetic spectrum or digital networks. The amount of data second agencies collect is exceptionally high. No other government agencies uh, have the legal authority or the technical capability to collect data at such a large scale. Big data-driven AI like machine learning seems naturally appealing for second agencies who need help to make sense of the massive data they collect. But the connection of AI and second starts even earlier. Second and AI share historical roots because both fields were driven by the ideas of computing and automation. Nobody represents this connection better than Alan Turing. During the Second World War, the code-breaking efforts by Turing and his team had driven the invention of Colossus, the first digital and programmable computer. Colossus perform performed the statistical tests that helped to decipher high-level communications by the Germans. Five years after being involved in the construction of the machine, whose algorithmic calculations helped to win the war, Turing famously asked, can machines think, and designed the Turing test. So automation was key for SIGINT since the early days of cryptoanalysis. And in the past, technologies developed in intelligence often shaped commercial products. But in contrast to the times of early computers and satellites, Today, private companies take the lead in many information technologies. This is especially true for AI. Government funding for AI can keep up with the private sector. This doesn't mean, of course, that intelligence agencies have stayed away from AI. Their AI investments remain hidden in black budgets. In 2012, the NSA has spent $34 million for research on machine learning for language analytics. The CIA works on 137 projects that leverage AI to, in some way. I don't have numbers for the NSA, but I assume it wouldn't let the CIA take the lead. So what else do we know about the use of AI in SIGINT? Based on the Snowden documents and recent reports, I made this list of applications where automated decision making and particularly machine learning is or might be used in SIGINT. On an operational level, machine learning is used for language analytics, satellite imagery, and cyber security. Still explored or classified are the use of AI for computer network exploitation or hacking and the analysis of biometric data. Sorry. <laughs> um, intelligence agencies um, are preparing to use 
counter, uh, to, are preparing to use and counter disinformation enhanced by machine learning. And they are also engaging in predictive analytics. They usually don't use predictive analytics, but often the term forecasting events. Multimodal AI is where second agencies want to go. This would be a system that can simultaneously analyze audio, imagery, and video. So now let me give you three concrete examples of those applications that I've skipped here. Target discovery, algorithmic citizenship, and drones. Machine learning is used to identify suspicious behavior in order to discover completely new targets for surveillance. One NSA program that uses this technique is Skynet. Skynet was designed to find the careers of terrorists and uses data on what is called patterns of life, the social network, and the travel behavior of people. I would like to draw your attention to two problems with this program. First, programs like these will be used on many people who are completely innocent. But even worse, it will systematically target another group whose behavior is not so different from those of terrorists or their careers, journalists. Algorithms like these might put journalists under systematic surveillance, not by accident, but because it was trained to discover patterns that are also typical for journalistic work. So it was a success for the NSA analysts that Skynet identified the behavior of the journalist Ahmed Zaidan as highly suspicious. Zaidan worked as an Islamabad bureau chief reporting on Taliban and Al-Qaeda. The second problem um, I want to address is the quality of the algorithm. The Skynet algorithm had a false alarm rate of 0.18% at a 50% miss rate. That means that the algorithm would still put thousands of innocents under surveillance, while every second terrorist career will be missed. Well, even if the algorithm has improved, or if algorithms in general improve, my point here is that accuracy needs to be understood differently in a high-risk environment, um, such as intelligence, than an algorithm proposing advertisements. The next example shows how the NSA uses algorithmic decision making to decide who's a national citizen and who gets granted privacy rights in the first place. To understand this, it's important to know that in most countries, legal constraints on surveillance only apply to citizens, while foreigners count as fair game. The claim we only target foreigners, not our own citizens, was and is success successfully used by intelligence agencies to justify large-scale data collection in the first place. Yet, the globally distributed way the internet works makes a clear distinction between foreign and domestic almost impossible. So how could one determine a fixed concept like citizenship, citizenship in such a dynamic environment like the internet? Of course, the NSA wouldn't check people's passports before spying. For the last example, I would like to draw your attention to the security risks of AI. This picture shows a live video feed from an Israeli drone. The British DCHQ and the NSA had worked together to hack the drone's camera. This hack shows how vulnerable autonomous systems are in a highly adversarial field like intelligence, where even partners are also targets. With machine learning, drones can fly autonomously on large swarms with computer vision and detect abnormal behavior. But with knowledge of the network architecture, those systems are far from secure. Even state-of-the-art AIs can be easily fooled, and researchers have indicated that deep learning AIs may be even more vulnerable. So what is at stake when AI meets second touches the core of democracy? A secret algorithm decides if we are considered citizens with constitutional rights. AI systems decide what counts as suspicious behavior and could harm not only privacy but also press freedom. In an adversarial field like intelligence, there's a constant risk for autonomous systems to be compromised. So let's put it that way, there is a need for good AI policies. 
Yet, regulation of intelligence has never been easy. This is especially true for two features of SIGINT, transnationality and secrecy. Allow me to step back from AI for a moment and explain the feature of transnationality um, in a bit more detail. Intelligence is considered to be at the core of the nation state. This should not, however, blind us to the fact that SIGINT is conducted within surprisingly stable transnational agreements. The agreements that we know relatively well are the SIGINT agreements by the NSA. The five eyes form the closed circle of NSA's network as second party partners who share technologies and data through automated systems. The five eyes function pretty much like a marriage. They promise fidelity, but they make exceptions. These second parties are complemented by B and multilateral agreements with third party partners. These are like, less like a marriage, but more like carefully chosen friends or cousins, ranging from closer relationships to more superficial ones. There are also multilateral networks composed by the five eyes and selected third parties, such as the SIG and Seniors Europe and the SIG and Seniors Pacific. This is a world map that shows the, the geography of NSA's main formal SIG and relationships. Of course, there are many other networks that we don't know about. I use the concept of fields by the French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu to describe SIGINT as a transnational profession where agencies with different resources, jointly but antagonistically, struggle over access to data and the means to analyze them. In this struggle, AI is going to be a major asset, even if a perceived one. Powerful players in this field, like the NSA or GCHQ, or services from Russia and China, will set new standards that partners and antagonists will try, will try to achieve as well. So we should be conscious about a potential AI arms race and the implication it might have for democracy and security. But the dynamics of secret partnerships are also a challenge in terms of accountability. While SIGINT has evolved into a transnational field, intelligence oversight has not. SIGINT, and especially everything that happens in SIGINT partnerships, have a very high classification level, even within intelligence. So let's leave any good reasons for or against secrecy aside for a moment and focus on the sociological consequences of secrecy here. Secrecy is an institutionalized right to act with a high degree of autonomy and has become part of the habitus of this profession. Over time, in-house developed algorithms become taken for granted in the same way internal interpretations of law have become legitimate to insiders, but may well contradict the mainstream legal discourse outside of intelligence. These internal rules can only be challenged or reconsidered in critical moments, like it has been after the Snowden leaks. But no one can litigate the use of algorithms that we don't know to exist. AI adds another layer of autonomy and secrecy to the existing socio-technical black box of SIGINT. So it's important that democratic societies don't leave the development of AI to internal negotiations between agencies and AI companies. To come back to the quote of the beginning, we should make sure that AI policies are more than bold. To begin with, civil society and journalists can help to establish public scrutiny even if very limited. Research by technical communities can help drawing attention to what accuracy, ac accuracy means um, in the context of high-risk environments, or expose how easily algorithms can be manipulated in adversarial settings. Of course, and this would be the pitch of today, SICKEN should also be included in research on AI policy, ethics, and law. What are the possibilities, for example, to expand, expand the repertoire of litigation from mass surveillance and hacking to AI? Finally, we should empower the main accountability institutions that are already in place, intelligence oversight bodies. I think it's crucial to establish transnational connections between oversight bodies who can learn from each other in terms of legal safeguards or institutional practices. 
Some countries already started to account for AI in recent oversight reforms. The Netherlands, for example, have introduced a duty of care provision for the intelligence agencies that obliges them to implement safeguards for the qualities of algorithms. They also introduced a human in the loop safeguard for automatic decision making. So let me end with three very brief conclusions. Um, so second deserves to be added to the list of domains addressed in AI research. We should take the transnational and antagonistic nature of SICKEND into account when we think about the increasing use of black boxes and the in in increasing use of black boxes into a culture of secrecy. Second, considering the high-risk environment of intelligence and wide-ranging powers SICKEND agencies have, the stakes are high for core features of democracy that go beyond privacy. And third, I'd like to highlight the need for oversight that is transnationally connected and AI aware. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Ronya. Um, so we have about five minutes for questions, which means either one or two. Nitsan? So we'll have time for answering. Okay. Maybe, maybe we'll stop here, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, so um, for all lawyers who are interested in this, it's definitely, definitely worth to have a look at the, this new Dutch law. It was introduced with a, a last intelligence reform. The short form is W-I-V, uh, and um, they introduced several duty of care provisions that are not so different from data protection um, law. Uh, of course, in intelligence, there's always uh, a bit of a difference. So the, um, there was a proposal that um, the oversight body would be responsible to uh, check on that duty of care provision, but that one was rejected. So the ones who are in charge of this duty of care are the general directors of the services themselves. So again, um, this was for me a bit of the dark side of this new uh, provision. And um, the duty of care provi provision for algorithm is like a, a subset of more duty of care provisions. So, so yeah, it's definitely worth to have a look at it. Thanks. Um, you know, always the puzzle with the, the things that I'm researching is that in terms of the technology, you can get sometimes astonishing results. Uh, and it's true. If I give you a large enough uh, group of your friends and their credit score, statistically we know it's very likely that we'll be able to guess your credit score or something within the range of uh, 10 points of your credit score. But here it's not a statistical question. It's a normative dilemma. Would we feel comfortable about scoring a person by reference to his friends or would it affect actually my right to associate with people because uh, I would probably not choose friends with a low credit scoring. Uh, or maybe I would try to flatter people like the dean with high credit scoring, so <laughs> by reference I'll be affected. We never ask actually the normative questions and it's true that in reality, companies for employment now and for uh, deciding on peer-to-peer uh, -peer loans would take into account your friend's credit scoring in determining yours, 
and it's sort of an area which is not regulated yet. Any other questions? Yes, please. Wow, we really need much more time for that, but time has passed. Uh, so thank you all so much. Uh, <laughs> we now go for 14 minutes of break, uh, and then Evita uh, Matania will be here. So um, coffee, please. Hello,